Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Mike and Beverly Howard. Hello. And we're doing a Bible study through the book of Luke. It's the Lifeway a Bible book series. And we're in lesson eight on the book of uh, Luke. And today's lessons, Luke chapter four, verses 16 through 30. It's the story of when Jesus went back home to Nazareth and preached at the synagogue and was rejected. Uh -huh. Therefore, the title of the lesson today is Rejection. Well, let me catch you up on some background if you haven't been with us. The first five, six lessons dealt with the announcement of and the birth of both John the Baptist and Jesus. And it all happened, uh, we were teaching those lessons around the Christmas time, and we we're all excited to have the Savior born unto us. Uh, and so it was just uh, those were real celebratory lessons for us as Christians. And then last week, uh, the writer of these lessons jumped way ahead to teach a lesson, to have a lesson on compassion. And in that lesson last week, uh, we were instructed to increase our compassion to be that the same as the compassion that God and that Jesus Christ has for us. So we need to step up our compassion game. Now we're gonna go backwards to chapter four. John the Baptist has already baptized Jesus. Jesus has had his temptation in the wilderness and now he's called his disciples, his apostles, and he's been ministering probably somewhere between six months and a year, mostly in the Capernaum, uh, Bethsaida area of Northern uh, Galilee, the, the north, uh, northern part of the Sea of Galilee. So maybe 40 or so miles from his hometown of Nazareth. He's been back and forth a couple of times to Jerusalem to celebrate, celebrate the Passover. So now we're gonna catch up with Jesus as he returns home. So let's go ahead and get started. First of all, uh, let's do a definition of what the word rejection or reject means. Uh, it first of all means to refuse to recognize. Uh, I'm just not gonna see you as my president or I'm not gonna see you as my authority. It, you refuse to hear or to receive whatever the message is. You refuse to submit to uh, whatever the message or a command tells you to commit to. So I reject the authority of that command. I'm not gonna do the speed limit. I'm not gonna stop at the stop sign. Uh, refuse to accept something. That's kind of the opposite of reject is to accept. And then there's the term to cast out. Uh, when you think of rejecting something, you think of uh, buying a, a bag of apples and you look through there and there's a rotten apple, so you reject that apple uh, out of the bag or you cast it out. So <clears throat> those are all terms for rejection. So rejection, uh, and I know that we all know this, but let me just refresh our minds. Rejection is not easy. It's actually very difficult. We all, everybody that's listening to this, everybody in the world has been through some type of rejection. And quite frankly, we go through rejection almost on a daily basis, usually in a small way like having something that we say or something that we do dismissed or are, are con, you know, confronted or said, no, I don't like. Just this past week, I had, a, I had a meeting and my idea in the meeting was rejected. Well, that's okay. They didn't reject me as a person. They rejected the idea. And I'm going to share a secret with you. Not all of my ideas are great. So in that yeah. case, it probably, yeah, I'm, I'm telling you, it happens sometimes. I don't know what happens. Sleep on the wrong side. We don't get enough sleep. Sometimes our rejections are small and sometimes they're large and those are even more painful being rejected, for example, in a relationship. Uh, if your spouse leaves you or if uh, a good friend decides that they don't wanna be your friend anymore, those kinds of rejections are extremely painful to us. So they hurt. As a matter of fact, they've done MRIs uh, on people when they ask them to remember being rejected and the same part of the brain lights up in an MRI uh, when you think about rejection as when you are in physical pain. Mm. So the rejection causes physical pain. Mm. And when we as Christians experience <clears throat> rejection, no matter whether it's rejection because of Jesus or just rejection in some other part of our lives, we then can get a small taste of how God feels and how Jesus felt when people reject him. Jesus knew from the very beginning that he was going to be rejected Large, by and large by Israel. Uh, and it started very early in his ministry. As a matter of fact, today is the first recorded um, story of Jesus being rejected, but it continued throughout his ministry and obviously 
culminated in him being crucified, totally rejected by the leadership in Israel. And we know that we care, he told the apostles, you are gonna be rejected because of me. And we know that as Christians, that even today, when we tell people the gospel, they're gonna reject not only the gospel message, but reject us as the people who are telling the gospel message. Rejection is painful. And I wanted all of us just to take a minute and just consider how painful rejection has been in our own personal lives. And for us to understand that Jesus was human and even though his ministry, he knew his ministry was going to have a lot of rejection in it, that did not make the rejection that he suffered any less physically painful. We always think of the pain that Jesus endured as being the pain that he endured on the cross. But I have to believe that all of the cases where he was rejected were very, very painful to him. I can remember him shedding tears over Jerusalem because Jerusalem, the people of Jerusalem had rejected him. So we do not understand what that means. And Isaiah tells Jesus way ahead of time, six, 700 years ahead of his life, that Jesus was going to be despised and rejected by mankind. He was gonna be a man of suffering. And here it is, he's familiar with pain. So it's the pain of rejection. So let's get started. Uh, it's a fairly short story, uh, but I'll, I'll do my best to uh, make it longer. <laughs> Explain it better. <laughs> Elaborate on it. How's that? Uh, Luke chapter 4, <laughs> verse 16. Jesus went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, hometown. On a Sabbath day, uh, he went to the synagogue. By the way, we've, this story is repeated in all the other gospels, and we know that uh, from some of the other gospels that some of his family was at the synagogue. His brothers were there. Uh, we also know that um, his disciples, at least his apostles, were with him at this point in time. So on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue, as was his custom, and he stood up to read. Now they, the, uh, the rabbi or the teacher of the day would stand up, read the scripture, then sit down and deliver the sermon. Okay, verse 17, and, on the, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written. Now, we just finished uh, last quarter a study of Isaiah, so this is still pretty familiar to us. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. And the word here used is pistosios, and that's a, there are several Greek words for saying that someone is poor. This particular word, the root of it is uh, to be crouched down as a beggar with your hand up. Oh, okay, so it's the, it's poor, in the, and it's the same word that's used in the Beatitudes, where where Jesus says, "Blessed are those who are poor in spirit." Cool. Okay, so it's the same word for poor. Now, other words for poor are used, like the woman who was poor uh, and gave her only penny. That was just a a word that she just really was not very wealthy, or she was extremely poor. But this is a beggar kind of poor. So he, God, has anointed me to proclaim good news to the beggars. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind and to set the oppressed free. Verse 19, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then he rolled up the scroll. So that was the reading of the scripture. But it's interesting. Okay, first of all, everybody knew this scripture really, really well. It's a very familiar passage because it's a passage regarding the Messiah. And especially around this point in time, the Holy Spirit has caused people, the Jewish people, to really get excited about the coming of the Messiah. There was talk everywhere that the Messiah's coming was imminent, okay? So everybody was prepared. Everybody was looking around to see the Messiah. And so these verses were often preached on on a regular basis, so they knew that they were Messianic verses. But he stopped there, and that's not where the verse stops. Now, actually, there were no verses in Isaiah, but that's not where the quote stops in Isaiah. It says then that he, after he says to proclaim, proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, then he rolled up the scroll. So that's all that he read, but here's the rest to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God. The fact that he left that out lets us know that right now we're living at the time of the, the year of the Lord's favor. It's not just one year, it's been 2000 so far, but there will come a point in time when the same Jesus who has been anointed with the Holy Spirit will 
come back for the day of the vengeance of our God. And that will be the day of judgment. That's his second returning. So then it says he rolled up the scroll and he gave it back to the attendant and he sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. And let me tell you why. They had all heard unbelievable stories about the miracles that he had uh, done in the area around Capernaum and um, in the northern uh, Galilean area. He had become quite famous, at least in that part of the world, and probably in most of the nation of Israel, word was getting around that this was a man who was able to perform all kinds of miracles. He gave sight to the blind. He was able to heal leprosy, he cast out demons. This was really special stuff. This, they hadn't seen anybody this powerful. And they also had heard that his teaching was very powerful, unlike any other teachers. And they were gathered there and their eyes were fastened on him because they'd heard all these things, but they knew who he was. <laughs> he was little Jesus, Joshua, who was the son of Joseph, Joseph who had grown up and walked the streets as he grew up, had brothers and sisters. They all knew Mary. They all knew Joseph. And yet, all of a sudden, this newly famous person is returning, and they just can't wait to hear what he's got to say. Mm -hmm. He began saying to them, today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Mm. Point number one of his sermon is, I'm the Messiah. That certainly got their attention. But at this point in the sermon, all spoke well of him, and they were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. And they were murmuring to each other and saying, hey, isn't this Joseph's son? Wow, isn't that Mary's son? Isn't that the brother of James? In verse 23, Jesus said to them, surely are you going to quote this proverb to me? He's kind of reading their minds. Physician, heal yourself. And you're going to tell me, do here in your, home, in your own hometown what we have heard that you did in Capernaum. In other words, perform some of those miracles that we've heard that you can perform. That's what you're wanting me to do. But he says, I'm not going to do that. Truly, I tell you, he continued, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. And this is a quote from the Old Testament. And note in John chapter 4, in a parallel version of this story, uh, uh, well, it's actually not this story. Uh, this is the, in John chapter 4, verses, verse 44, Jesus is, the, remember the woman at the well in Samaria, the Samaritan woman? He stays there for two days and, and tells them that he's the Messiah and, and they, they believe but he also says in that scripture, he says, Jesus says, no, a prophet has no honor in his home country. Mm -hmm. So what he's saying there is not only does he have, not only is he, not only is he rejected in his own hometown, he's also going to be rejected in his own home country. Verse 25. Well, the sermon has all of a sudden hit the rocks. And he says, I assure you that there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time when the sky was shut for three and a half years and there was a severe famine throughout the land. Yet Elijah was not sent to any of them, but to a widow in Zarephath in the region of Sidon. Mm -hmm. And point number three in his sermon, there were many in Israel with leprosy at the time of Elijah the prophet, Elisha the prophet. Yet not one of them was cleansed, only Naaman the Syrian. So he's just told them two stories about how God worked in the lives of Gentiles, where there was the same need in Israel. Hmm. And then after he told those two stories, it's a good three-point sermon. Point number one, <laughs> I'm the Messiah. And, uh, and he also mentioned that he was a prophet. Remember, a prophet is not accepted in his own hometown. So he says, I am the Messiah. I am the anointed one. I am a prophet, the prophet. And so that's his first point. And the second point is, is uh, you know, that th these, uh, th there were people that were widows in Israel and none of those widows were taken care of 
but a widow in Sidon was. And then Naaman was a leper, but he was from actually an enemy country and God healed him instead. So by this point in the sermon, uh, the original expectations of the people in the synagogue had turned into anger. So verse 28 says, all the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. They got up, drove him out of town, took him to the brow of a hill on which the town was built in order to throw him off the cliff. So they went from welcome home, homeboy, to we're going to kill you. We're going to kill you. But he walked right through the crowd and he went on his way. Cool. So we don't know what happened that he walked through the crowd and went on his way. We have to assume it was miraculous. Uh, but they went from being well, for example, in the beginning, all in the beginning of his sermon, all spoke well of him and they were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. Hmm. We assume his sermon lasted about 20 to 30 minutes like most of our sermons do. Could have been a lot quicker. At the end, a few minutes later, all the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this and they took him out to kill him. Wow, mm. what a sermon. So, what did he say? I mean, it seems like he just told a couple of stories. It's just hard to understand how they went from saying good things about him to being so furious they wanted to kill him so there must, he, there must be something about those stories that were infuriating to the people in the hmm. synagogue. Even though Jesus was making a serious point, those stories struck a raw nerve. So let's see if we can't dig in a little bit. <clears throat> so what did he say? Let's summarize. First of all, he told them that he was the Messiah. He was the anointed one. He also told them that he was a prophet and that they would reject him. And then he told them that he was not their Messiah. Whoa. <clears throat> Screeching halt. Back up the truck. Let's take a look at that one again. Point number three, he told them that he was not called, not anointed to save them. Oh, wow. They have been expecting the Messiah. They've been looking forward to the Messiah. They know that the Messiah was gonna get rid, come and get rid of the Romans. He was gonna lift Israel back to this previous glory. He was gonna bring God down to them. He was gonna do wonderful things. And the first sermon Jesus preaches to them is, I am the Messiah. I'm just not your Messiah. So let's figure out how we get to that statement. And the answer is in the two stories that he told. When did he say that he wasn't their Messiah? And the answer is in those two stories, Elijah and the widow of Sidon. Elijah had announced, this is the background on that story. Elijah is a prophet, obviously, and he was a prophet during the time of Ahab, who was the king of Israel at the time. And we all remember that Ahab's wife was Jezebel, who was a Gentile. But what, what, what you, <laughs> but anyway, the point of the story is Elijah had just announced at this point, and you can find it in 1 Kings chapter 17. He had just announced that there was going, God was going to punish Israel for worshiping Baal instead of God. And that punishment was going to come as a three and a half year drought. They weren't gonna have rain, therefore the crops were gonna fail. They were gonna run out of food. They were gonna run out of water. They were gonna die of starvation because they had been worshiping Baal. Why, how did they get to worshiping Baal? And the answer is Ahab, Bible says Ahab was not only a bad king, he was worse than all the other bad kings rolled in together. That's how bad Ahab was. And Jezebel, we all know who Jezebel was. Not only was she a Gentile, but her father was a priest of Baal and she brought Baal worship right into the kingdom with her when she married Ahab. And everybody was worshiping Baal because the king and the queen were worshiping Baal. So, and oh, by the way, she was from the region of Sidon. Mm -hmm. So everybody hated people from the region of Sidon because that's where Jezebel was from. So point number one, 
Everybody hated Ahab because he brought Baal worship in. And then everybody really hated Jezebel because she was the one that brought it in with him. And then everybody really hated Sidon because Sidon was where Jezebel and her family were from. So do you understand? It's like, we don't, we don't really hate any place right now, but you know, think of North Korea or maybe Russia during the Cold War uh, or Germany during World War II or Japan perhaps during World War II. You know, and somebody comes in and tells us a story of some God doing something wonderful for them. They were your enemy. Why would God do something for them? So Elijah and the widow of Sidon. God sends Elijah during this three and a half year drought not to stay with a widow in Israel to get food and water, but all the way to another place called Zarephath. But we're also told that Zarephath is in the region of Sidon. Of Sidon. Yeah. So God sends Elijah to Russia to take, be taken care of for the drought. And the widow then, when we get there, is gathering wood to prepare her last meal before she and her son starve to death. She's got this much flour to make one last loaf of bread and just a little bit of oil and not much water. They have been starving for quite some time and they literally are both on their deathbeds. They are desperate in need of food. And so when that happens, Elijah walks up and he says, here's what you need to do. You need to give me some water, she did. He said, now you need to go bake me a loaf of bread. And she says, I was just about to bake the last loaf of bread so that my son and I could have one last meal before we die. And Elijah says, God will take care of you, but you need to give me your last loaf of bread. And she did. She obeyed because she was desperate and the flour and oil never ran out. You can think if you put yourself in her place, she's probably thinking, this is my last hope. This is a man of God. She believed in God. Whether or not I eat this last of her breath may extend my life another day, but what's another day? Instead, if I trust my life to this prophet of God, he may give me life. She was desperate, and so she did. Out of her desperation came her salvation. So let's talk about the Naaman, the Armenian, Ara, Ara, Aramean soldier. Aram, which is now Syria, was constantly raiding Israel. They were not good neighbors. They were to the northeast of Israel, and they were constantly sending raiding parties in, capturing people, taking them back to be slaves, they were constantly robbing convoys and, 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 and people there and just taking the money back. Not good neighbors. Uh, and also they were very powerful too. Naaman was the commander of the army of Aram and he had leprosy. And we don't know if it was the what we call leprosy today or if he had skin cancer real bad or we don't know exactly what type of skin affliction that he had. They just call it leprosy in the translation but we know that it was debilitating. It was killing him. And so an Israelite girl had been captured and in one of these raids that they went into Israel, they captured this Israelite girl and now she was a servant of Naaman's wife. And when he got, uh, when he found out that he had this leprosy and that it was gonna kill him, uh, she went to Naaman's wife and said, Naaman needs to go see the prophet of God in Israel he can heal him from the leprosy. So the wife told Naaman and Naaman says, I'm desperate, I need to be healed. I'm gonna die if I don't get healed and this is the last chance. I've already been to all the doctors, nobody can help me out, I'll try anything. So, the, the, so Naaman approached Elisha, so he goes to Israel and there's another part of the story I won't get into, but then he goes to Elisha's house and he, he, sends, he yells at Elisha in his house, you know, who he was and what he was there for. And Elisha sends a servant out and says, uh, Elisha says you need to go dunk yourself seven times in the river. Well, Naaman is 
the number one general in Aram reports directly to the king. He's got this entourage with him. He's a really powerful man. He's got a lot of pride. And this prophet won't even come out of the house to see him face to face. He just sends a servant out to say, look, go dip yourself in the water over in the river seven times. Naaman was furious, just furious because of his pride. He said, we have cleaner rivers in Aram than they have these filthy river here in Israel. And I could dip myself in those rivers and it's a way cleaner thing to do. And he won't even come out and see me and mumble, 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 gripe, gripe, gripe. Well, then some of his friends, some of the people with him said, Naaman, you're dying. If you don't get healed, you don't know going to die. The doctors have given up on you. You're desperate. This is your last chance. Desperate. If he, the prophet, had asked you to do something great, you would, have, you would not have hesitated to do it. Mm. And yet, all he asked you to do was to dip seven times in the river. So Naaman did. He dipped seven times in the river, and the seventh time when he came up, he was cured. Naaman put aside his pride because this was his last chance. He was desperate. He needed to be healed. Jesus told two stories. And what he told the people in Nazareth is, I came to, to uh, for those who are poor, for those who are captives, for those who are blind, for those who who have been mistreated. I came as the Messiah for those who have no other hope, those who are desperate. That's who I am the Messiah for. And they rejected that story because they were Israelites. They were Abraham's children. And oh, by the way, they were Jews. And that meant that they were God's chosen people. And they weren't desperate or poor or blind or prisoners or oppressed. So they thought. So they thought. <laughs> the message that Jesus gave was the, to the people uh, of Nazareth and most in Israel that they were not desperate for God's salvation. They weren't poor, they weren't blind, they weren't oppressed. Therefore, God's Messiah, God's Messiah, his anointed one, couldn't do anything to help them because they didn't think they needed any help. So the question is, summary is, do you need to be saved? We all have rebelled against God and God wants that relationship with him that's now broken to be restored and the way he did that was he sent his son Jesus to pay the penalty for our rebellion by dying on the cross. He was sinless and he died for us. Now that that's happened, we can be restored, we can be saved, we can be redeemed. But that salvation, according to Jesus' first hometown sermon, is only for those who see that they need it. Only for those who are desperate. John MacArthur says it this way. I thought this was a great quote. There's only one reason why people who know the gospel message choose to reject Christ, and it is because they do not see themselves as the poor, the blind, the prisoners, mm. the oppressed. Mm. And then he goes on to say this. God offers nothing to people who are content with their own condition except judgment. And uh, it wasn't just Nazareth. You remember he spent a year and a half, maybe two years doing these miracles, healing people and teaching in the area around the northern part of the Sea of Galilee. And there were three cities there. There was Chorazin, Bethsaida and, and Capernaum. And they were all, you can all think, you can think, they were real close together. You can think of all of them as Capernaum. He says in Luke chapter 10, verse 14, but it will be more bearable for Tyre and Sidon did you see Sidon in here? Again. Again? It will be more bearable for Tyre and Sidon at mm. the judgment. Gentile territories than for you. And you, Capernaum, 
Will you be lifted up to the heavens? Will you be saved? No. Even after I've been here a year and a half, I've been performing miracles. I've been teaching you about the kingdom of God, but you have chosen to reject it. You will go down to Hades. Strong message to follow. And I can't remember what chapter this is in. I'm, I think I, I but in any way, uh, the good news is only for desperate people. Jesus is about, it could be chapter five. He's about to send out uh, his disciples so, uh, to, to tell the good news to other people. So he's telling them, it's time for you to go and tell about the Messiah, tell about God's salvation, his plan, his good news. So he's saying this to them. He says, whoever listens to you, and he's talking to the disciples, but if you fast forward 2,000 years, this verse is to us, Christians. Whoever listens to you about the good news, you, the Christians, you, Christians, whoever listens to you about the good news, listens to me. That means that when they listen to our message about Jesus, they're listening to Jesus. But then he says, whoever rejects you, your message about the gospel, is rejecting me. But whoever rejects me, rejects him who sent me, and that's God. So when we're giving the message of the good news, of God's salvation of his plan, and people reject it, they reject it because they don't know that they need it. They believe with all their hearts that they're just fine. What they don't understand is their condition from God's perspective. They think that if they've got money or if they're in happy with their family or happy with their jobs or happy with their lives, that they don't really need this salvation. So because they don't see that they need it, they reject it. And by rejecting it, they're rejecting Jesus. And by rejecting Jesus, ultimately and eternally, they're rejecting God. So the question then that I'll end with is this. To the lukewarm church at Laodicea, are we still desperate for God? In Revelation chapter three, verses 17 and 18, Jesus talking to the church at Laodicea, which is one of the seven churches, says, you say, you the church at Laodicea, you church members, you say, I'm rich. I've acquired great wealth and I don't need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor. By the way, guess which Greek word is used by Jesus here or poor? It's the same, same word, word, beggar. Blind and naked. And then he goes on to say, I ask you, I implore you to buy from me gold refined by fire. And we all know what that means in our lives, that we have to submit ourselves to the refining fire of God's plan in our lives. So what's a good prayer? If we're, we see here that the reason that the people in his hometown, his own hometown, went from being very receptive to trying to kill him within a 30 minute period was because he told them that they are not going to be chosen by God to be saved. And then he, cho he told them why. And the why is because they don't see themselves as needing God's salvation, his forgiveness from sin. And then he tells the church, and this is us as Christians, not to be lukewarm in our relationship with him, but to be desperate for him, to need him, to understand that without him, we can't do anything. And Jesus said it that way, I'm the vine, you're the branches. Without me, you can't do anything. So this is a song that Michael W. Smith sings called Breathe. Uh, so it says, this is the air that I breathe, your holy presence living in me. It's the daily, my daily bread, your very words spoken to me. And he says, I am desperate for you because I am lost without you. That has to be our theme song as Christians. Mm -hmm. 
we have to live a life of constant desperation for the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, for the wisdom that comes from God, from the guidance that God provides, from the salvation of sin, for the forgiveness of our daily sins. We have to have that sense of desperation that we need God every single moment of our lives. And in that desperation will come our daily salvation. So pray with me. Father, I know that this sermon caused the people in his hometown, in Jesus' hometown, to be furious. And Father, this message would cause any Israelite to be furious because basically it says that they have rejected Jesus and by rejecting Jesus, they have rejected a relationship with you. So Father, do not let us make that same mistake. Help us to see where we are poor, where we are blind. Give us eyes to see. Give us an understanding that we are simply beggars for your grace and your mercy because, Father, we deserve none of it. The pastor's been teaching sermons on blessed are the poor and blessed are those who mourn. And, Father, this is just that. It's a lesson about being desperate for you because without you, we are nothing, we have nothing, and we can't be who you want us to be. So, Father, given each one of us listening to this, a sense of who we are in our old nature and help us to understand that our only hope is in Jesus Christ. And because of that, we can be your children. Because of that, we can do great things in Christ. But in ourselves, we are poor and we're blind and we're still struggling. But in Christ, mm. we are victorious. Yes. In Jesus' name I pray it. Amen. Amen. Well, we love you guys. Mm -hmm. uh, I hope this lesson doesn't have the same effect that Jesus' sermon had on his hometown. <laughs> uh, I hope that you can join with me in understanding our need for God working in us daily. And Father, maybe that'll give us uh, some impetus to go and share that good news uh, with others. Understanding that the pain for, that we get from rejection is going to be just as painful to us as it was to Jesus. So Beverly and I say, stay safe, be good, get vaccinated if you can figure out how to get a shot, uh, and we'll hopefully see you soon. Take care. Bye-bye.